that I we were singing we were singing her praises earlier in our senior staff meeting uh, for not only having been the artist uh, for Rabbi Klingfeld's Kachuba, um, but also before I came to Temple Beth Am, I worked at a synagogue in Northern California, and she and I, though we never met in person, um, we were able to put together a very beautiful array of, um, of Torah covers before I left, and so those Torah covers are, are still are still in that sanctuary, even though I am not. So it's lovely to see you on, uh, it's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it's good to see you, Jeanette. So Hillel, as, as Leah mentioned, Hillel is a very good friend of mine. And it really, it's just such a pleasure to be able to introduce him uh, because I get such a kick out of the fact that I actually know one of these artists very personally. Um, Hillel lived across the hall from me, or really I lived across the hall from Hillel uh, when I was in rabbinical school. And so many of the really beginning art pieces of many, much of what you'll see right now, Hilla was working on. Uh, we were we were the recipients of many a creative uh, Mishloach Manot basket or thing. I won't even call it a basket um, from Hillel during those days and, and some really beautiful art pieces that are on our wall. Uh, and so I'm going to read his bio because it's real, very beautifully written. Um, but I also just want to say that He's an amazing artist and one of the things that I find so compelling in artists and many of you I'm sure are either very interested in art or are artists yourself, yourselves, um, is that when you get to really see the soul of a person on the outside through what they are creating and you get to know who they are based on their outside creation. Uh, and Hillel just has a very kind and very generous and very sweet soul. And you get to see that in the very intentional art pieces that he creates. So uh, I will read his bio, but that is the personal love that I want to give to Hillel. Hillel is a wandering and wondering visual artist originally from Los Angeles, now based in Washington, Washington DC. He utilizes contemporary media, including spray paint and digital software to create new manifestations of traditional Jewish forms. His murals grace walls around the United States, Europe, and in Israel, redefining Jewish spaces. And he is the founder of the Jewish Street Art Festival. His work has been exhibited widely, and he is proud that his projects have found their way into classrooms and homes, including mine, worldwide. He provides graphic design and illustration for Jewish institutions, large and small, as well as for touring comedians and theatrical productions. Hillel also writes, lectures, and leads workshops on Hebrew typography and Jewish art, focusing on creative output as a tool for the construction of identity and connection. So Hillel, thank you so much for being here and just for being a wonderful person and friend in my life and I'm very excited to see and hear a little bit about you're going to share with us tonight. Yeah, thank you so much. This is, I mean, it, it's so wonderful to see really so many uh, familiar faces uh, on the Zoom um, and it, it's very true uh, that you, uh, Robert Schatz, were, were there when a lot of this started. Um, and so uh, thanks to Leah and the, the whole uh, Beth Om team for putting this program together. Um, and with that, I'll get right into it. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about today is to show some of my work and also try to put into a context of uh, what inspires me and, and how I approach the projects that I do, um, what I'm thinking about um, and what, what drives me when I'm putting these projects together. Um, so starting off, when we think about what is Judaica? Uh, we think about sometimes, uh, you know, ritual objects, books, wall art, um, and very often we think about a very particular aesthetic um, that we have. So this is uh, some images I found on the internet. These candlesticks are what I think of maybe like platonic uh, ideal of what candlesticks are supposed to look like. Um, you have a sitter. Uh, but what I try to express with my work is, well, what really, what's the potential? How can I rethink Judaica into a way that feels contemporary, that feels uh, of the moment, that feels relevant, um, and that also reflects the kinds of uh, aesthetic style that I appreciate. Uh, and I hope that also that other people appreciate um, and to be able to make work that uh, I think appeals to people on a different level. Um, so can a mural be Judaica? Um, it incorporates Jewish imagery, 
uh, it incorporates uh, liturgical text, so in that way it can be functional. Um, and for the last number of years, I've been putting together uh, a lot of pieces like this. This is at BB's Bakery in Los Angeles. Uh, if you can read it, it says Hamotzi Lacha Min Haaretz, which I thought was an appropriate theme to put on a bakery. Um, what about graphic design? Um, can I take this poster aesthetic uh, and using digital software create pieces that also could be Judaic in the way that they include traditional Jewish text, uh, express Jewish messages, uh, potentially even have a ritual function? Um, can I redesign what Jewish books can look like? Um, these are a set of wedding ventures for uh, various couples who have uh, gotten married over the last decade or so that I've been making these. Um, we have this idea of what a Jewish book should look like. You know, most sitters that you would find when you uh, go to services tend to have a, a very particular aesthetic. Um, and we can think of a Haggadah as a book that has a very wide graphic range, um, but we often don't see that range applied to other kinds of uh, liturgical texts that we use on a regular basis. Why not? Um, how can we think about other potential ritual objects that could exist that don't necessarily exist yet? Um, so uh, as mentioned, I work uh, every year, I put together a Mishloch Manot box um, to experiment with different kinds of package design um, and to be able to capture something about the Purim story or kind of the events of the year uh, in this object that is part of the ritual of giving gifts of food to friends uh, on forum as, as the Mishlach um, Manot. But how can I, instead of just giving the food, how can I engage in this, uh, this uh, endeavor of Hidur Mitzvah, of making the ritual beautiful through the packaging that I'm presenting this food in? Um, and then taking it a step further, how can I extend that whimsical approach to other products? Like in this case, graphic T-shirts. Um, you can. It's actually me in the middle a bunch of years ago. <laughs> um, and so, how can I include Jewish content in a way that's, uh, you know, funny and maybe a little bit edgy, uh, but doesn't quite get into the kind of pitch uh, that you'd often find in some of these, uh, in some of these modes. Um, so this is the kind of work that influenced me as a kid. I grew up on comic books. Uh, kind of really into the street art that I saw around Los Angeles, had a very particular eye for what kinds of art that I was interested in. Uh, this is uh, a Rene Magritte piece. So I love the, the way that different kinds of imagery were juxtaposed with, with each other, the kind of the humor um, and the strangeness of the pieces. And those are the kinds of uh, inspiration that I took with me when I started creating uh, Theater posters. These are posters for Patton Oswalt, who's a, um, a comedian. You may have seen him in movies and on television. Um, and so creating stuff that's funny, that's a little bit weird, um, that engages the viewer and, and really calls for a second look. And then looking at some occasional Jewish artists that had took a very different approach to the work that they were doing in a way that, that seemed to me to be very non-typical. Uh, so, uh, some pieces by Mordechai Rosenstein, the way that he has a very distinct style, uh, uses text in his work, um, and it tries to, or decades ago when he started this practice, even though he's still around and is still making work, of uh, creating a very unique approach to what Jewish art can look like. And then uh, moving even more to the present day, uh, organizations like Reboot that are engaging the community to rethink what Judaica can be, what can its role be in a social environment, in a uh, multicultural environment of the, of the city. Um, so this is a project they did where they engaged architects the world over to create different ideas for what a sukkah can be, thinking about what are the different actual rules for how a sukkah needs to be constructed, um, but using that as a starting point. Um, and that was very meaningful to me of, okay, well, how do I take that basic idea of using Jewish text, Jewish ritual as a starting point and then branching off from there? So I started off doing small format spray paint pieces. This is Theodore Herzl and his, uh, the Hebrew translation of his famous quote, uh, in su in agada, if you will, it is no dream. So this is, you know, wall art size. 
um, and then started moving from doing uh, wall size pieces to then actual pieces the size of walls. Um, so this is uh, a large mural that you can actually also see behind Leah in her background. Um, this is at Camp Ramon, California, uh, a big mural that I worked with the camp directors on of how do we create a piece that engages the kids, that speaks to what we're trying to achieve at camp. Um, so yeah, this was a handball wall that had seen better days. Um, and I worked with the camp directors to think of what's a theme that we want to express in, through this piece. Uh, this has a quote, uh, from Pirkei Avot, uh, which means uh, acquire for yourself a friend, which we thought was a very positive message for a camp. Um, and has this outstretched arm, very uh, bright colors. And the thinking being that if you can read the text, great, you'll get the message. Um, if you can't quite read the Hebrew at first glance, on the left-hand side, there is the uh, translation of what this text means so that anyone can engage with the piece. But even for kids who are too young to read, that the colors are bright enough, that the feeling is engaging enough, um, that will hopefully just draw people in and create the, uh, you know, have the effect that I'm trying to achieve with this. Uh, and I found it very rewarding to be able to make these large scale pieces at different locations around first Southern California and now around the world. Um, this is at uh, AJU. Um, the text is from Mishle from Proverbs. It says, Ashreya Dama Tzachosma, happy is the person who finds wisdom, which we thought was appropriate for a university setting, um, and adding a, a bit of color um, and a, a contemporary feel to a very uh, you know, established institution. Um, and so hopefully they can express through this piece that now graces their campus of uh, Judaism, Judaism is a modern, relevant uh, tradition. Um, and we have a modern and relevant approach to uh, this ancient faith. Uh, this is a piece at Westwood Gehila uh, near UCLA. Um, the building houses both an Ashkenazi and a Sephardi minion, a Persian minion. Um, and with, in this piece, uh, what they're dancing with the Torahs, and you can see there's a Ashkenazi and a Sephardi Torah um, to try to highlight all the different people who call this building home. Uh, this is uh, a longer piece. This is about eight feet tall on a retaining wall, 90 feet long. Um, this is uh, in what's called, known as the Melrose Alleys, uh, which are the alleys on either side of Melrose Avenue um, that are full of street art. This is the first place that I really saw uh, this kind of uh, street art when I was going through uh, riding my bike to the comic book store uh, that's right near there. Um, and what it, I, was interesting about this neighborhood is that this is at really the intersection between the uh, very orthodox uh, Fairfax, La Brea, Hancock Park neighborhood and the gay neighborhood in West Hollywood. And so in this piece, trying to bridge that divide between these two groups by picking this blessing, Shasani uh, Kirtano, um, of a uh, rough translation, uh, thanking God for making me as uh, was intended. Uh, and to hopefully be able to you know, build a bridge between these two communities through art um, and through this kind of big, uh, positive message. Uh, this is a piece at uh, the uh, St. Paul JCC in the Twin Cities. And this building, uh, a number of years ago, uh, had been vandalized with anti Semitic graffiti. And they had used all kinds of chemicals to try to get the swastika off the brick. Uh, and there was still this faint uh, impression of this. Uh, really kind of chemically burned into the brick. Um, and so rather than try to just paint over it, get rid of it, they called me to see if I could replace it with something positive. Um, and so working with them, uh, here, another outstretched hand, ushering people to the entrance, welcoming them in. Uh, and this piece incorporates in, uh, in Hebrew text, the values of the JCC. So kavod, kehila, and the uh, door, respect, community, and a uh, generation generation. Uh, and so really this piece was, which is now facing the main boulevard uh, that uh, the JCC is built on, um, can really become this focal point for community and engagement and outreach to the wider community. And over the years, I've been in touch with a number of other Jewish artists who are also working in large scale mural projects. Uh, many of them putting their own personal 
you know, Jewish connection into their work and however uh, you know, they themselves uh, relate to their Judaism. Um, and I thought for a while, wouldn't it be so cool to bring all of these artists together to paint something big together? Um, there are all these other mural festivals that happen in cities around, uh, around the world. What if there could be a Jewish mural festival that brought these muralists together to make a real impact? Uh, and also to, to show the Jewish world um, that Jewish art can be so much more uh, than what is often thought. Um, and so in 2019, finally had the opportunity to put this whole thing together. Uh, I gathered 10 artists from around the world, uh, brought them to Jerusalem. Uh, we painted 18 murals in three weeks uh, in October of 2019 uh, in conjunction with the Jerusalem Biennale. Uh, this is my piece at First Station in Jerusalem. Um, this is the concert stage. Uh, you can see the mural is Aleph Bet Gimel. Um, also very subtly, if you look at it a different way, uh, it very uh, subtly says Ahava. Um, because the slogan for the First Station is Yesh Bi Ahava, there's love here. Um, and it's tried to incorporate that message into the piece. Um, and what's really cool is that because this is the concert stage, uh, there, I get tagged on Instagram all the time because there are all these concerts that happen there. And I think it's so cool that this piece has this life without me that's uh, still going strong whenever there's, uh, there's a yoga class here, I think a couple mornings a week uh, in front of this mural. Um, and so it was very powerful for me to be putting this piece out there um, and also to be a part of this much bigger program um, where we coordinated with uh, the managers of First Station to have these murals put together by other Jewish artists um, all over the station. Uh, we also went elsewhere in Jerusalem, so there's a series of seven days of creation murals uh, at the artist colony in Jerusalem. Um, so this is just opposite Jaffa Gate. And so I did day one, uh, light and dark, and then you can see as it goes along the wall with different artists for each day, um, all the days of creation. And this program went super well, and we were planning uh, on doing another big program at a city in the U.S. Uh, sometime in the summer of 2020, and then the pandemic hit. And so obviously that, those plans weren't going to materialize, but one of the artists had this idea of, well, what if we each do a mural in our own city rather than going to a city together, and we can link these murals thematically, and that way we can, we can bring this feeling back to our, our own communities. Um, and it was such an amazing experience. So we organized eight artists, or uh, sorry, nine artists in eight cities, eight murals uh, for Hanukkah. Uh, so I did mine at the JCC in Washington, DC. So this uh, 17 foot tall menorah, so this is on the uh, backside of the JCC near the entrance of the preschool. Um, and one of the best parts about doing this piece was working with the community. Um, and because of the pandemic, everyone was no, the galleries are closed. Everyone's kind of stuck at home or going on walks. Um, and this way, I'm outside. I'm working, uh, showing off some part of this Jewish community to all the people who are walking by who no longer have the ability to go inside the JCC um, to engage with all their other arts and culture programming. Um, and then even more so, got to actually work with the JCC in putting this together. So you can see all these fallen leaves along the bottom of this mural were painted by their preschoolers. Um, we had them only do the fallen leaves on the bottom because they're very short. <laughs> and this is about as high as their little arms could reach. Um, and it was really fun working with them on that. And then all of the flames on the top of the menorah were painted by uh, major figures uh, at the JCC, so past presidents, board members, um, and other uh, people that the JCC wanted to honor um, in this, I, I found really very powerful way of uh, creating this piece for the community as a community. Uh, and we had such a great time putting this together over Hanukkah um, that uh, one of our funders called and said, should we do this again for Passover? Uh, and so in March, I uh, organized four artists. So we did four murals uh, for uh, different contemporary uh, issues um, in uh, you know, facing the world uh, in honor of Passover. So I did one in Brooklyn, uh, so that Repair the World's Office. Um, the piece is called What Sustains Us. So it's thinking about uh, food insecurity and food access, uh, which is the issue that I uh, 
I was working with uh, proposed by the Repair the World staff. Um, so you can see of this uh, fork, that's the outstretched hand, um, smiling food. If you look in the top corner, it says Hazana Takol. So from the uh, end of the first paragraph of uh, Birkata Mazon, um, uh, thanking God for sustaining us and approaching questions of, you know, whose responsibility is it to sustain our community through food? Um, and part of their role during the pandemic was to uh, act as a kind of soup kitchen of making sure that people had enough to eat. Uh, and then there's a uh, twin piece at the uh, JCC Harlem um, with, this is not painted, this, these were designed and then printed on the, it's a 50 foot uh, vinyl banner. Um, again, creating this fun, engaging piece about uh, kind of the happiness and the, the comfort and community that food gives to us. Uh, and this idea of uh, engaging with uh, identity is a thing that uh, I noticed early on of driving around Los Angeles, of seeing all of the murals that were very much based in the uh, ethnic uh, and uh, immigrant and uh, uh, religious communities around Los Angeles of how those individual communities express themselves through their street art. And that made such a big impact on me. Um, and that was a thing that I tried very much to do in the Jewish pieces that I'm putting out there in very much the same way. Um, but then also, I love that aesthetic of the spray painting. So how can I take that spray paint aesthetic and apply it to other pieces? So spray painting little tiny dreidels um, or spray painting holla covers. Um, how can I take each one of these different items and make them make them mine. Uh, and this idea of taking this kind of outside aesthetic and applying it to Jewish pieces is something that Jews have been doing for thousands of years. Uh, when I speak about Jewish art history and Jewish design history, I really like to focus on just exactly how much Jews as, uh, as a people have taken from the communities that they've been a part of. Um, so I, uh, I'm very inspired by uh, ancient uh, medieval manuscripts, and you can see very clearly um, how these the Jewish community in Spain is taking this aesthetic from their Muslim neighbors. Um, the same is true in Ashkenaz, so Central Europe, that these Ashkenazi Jews are taking very clearly this style that they see as uh, you know, beautiful and reverential and using it for their manuscripts. And that goes for kind of DIY arts as well, that in 18th century Central Europe, it was very common to have these pewter plates. Um, pewter is a very uh, malleable metal, so you can put your own design into it. And in many antique stores and uh, Jewish museums, actually I think uh, Sinai Temple has a whole bunch of these in their display uh, area. Um, Jewish families would take these plates and make them their own. You can find Seder plates. Uh, this, is a, uh, uh, this is also a Seder plate. You can see the names of the parts of the Seder around the outside. Um, and I love that idea of taking really whatever modes and, and materials are available to us and making them into uh, our own personal Judaica. Um, and as we move through time and history of looking at how much Jews took from their from the modern world, so and so Art Nouveau inspired posters, Dada inspired materials. Um, before Marc Chagall was the painter that we know him today, he was making covers of Yiddish literary periodicals. Um, and Lisitsky was one of the foremost uh, designers of the Bauhaus movement, and his work on Yiddish children's books then influenced other non-Jewish designers and brought out some of his own uh, heritage, uh, and then which was then picked up and expressed elsewhere in Europe. Uh, and then artists like Ludwig Volpert, who I love the way he used text. If you can't tell, I love working with text. Um, and thinking about, well, how can we use text in all kinds of ways? How can we make environmental design? How can we uh, change the face of, of ritual objects? So I love these candlesticks that have the opening lines of Kabbalah Shabbat designed into the candlestick. Um, and so this is what inspired me when I thought of, okay, well, what's a holiday that doesn't have a ritual object really attached to it? How do I make it? Um, and so here's uh, an early Mishnah Chmano a box that I did uh, using the horse that uh, Haman had to take Mordechai on walking around the city uh, with little dum dum lollipops that you can take out and eat. Um, one from a, a few years ago of uh, 
the king's palace uh, with doors that open showing Ahasuerus is sitting on his throne um, and the candy is behind this wall and you have to open it up from the side. Um, think about the idea of Mishal Chanot, these are gifts that we send to friends. So this is a box where uh, the food is inside. It's maybe about, uh, about half an inch thick. Um, so I could put very flat food in there. So uh, some Ghirardelli chocolates and uh, maybe a fruit roll. Uh, these are cutouts. This is cut out of the paper. Uh, and this is fruit by the foot uh, backing the cutout. So integrating the food into the packaging. Uh, and I, I love that uh, trying to figure out new ways of being playful with the materials that I'm using. Um, this is one uh, from a few years ago. So you can see it has uh, these cartoon caricatures of Mordechai wearing the, uh, the king's crown, Haman wearing his three corner hat, and Happy Purim from Hillel Smith. But one part of the story is uh, a major theme has been a that things were turned upside down. Um, there's also a tradition that you drink. So much that you can tell the difference between Mordechai and Haman. This whole box is rotationally symmetrical. So when you turn the box upside down, Mordechai literally turns into Haman, that they are just two sides of the same coin. Um, and it was fun to think about you know, how do I bring the, the whole story into the design of this object itself? Yes. Um, this is last year. Um, thinking about the effects that we can have from our own space uh, and also adding in another element, in this case, light. So this is this latticework box that has some candy inside, also a little uh, miniature LED light. And then when you close the box back up and put the light on top, they glow out from the outside. You can see this pattern on this, uh, in the latticework. When you view it from above, it says Happy Purim on the tabletop. Um, and so trying to think about, well, how do I add an additional element um, to some of these pieces? Um, this past year, as we're all partying from our homes and unable to really go outside uh, and experience community in person, um, I designed a, uh, a box that literally was my house um, and got uh, little blinking uh, colored LED lights. Um, so to invite you to my house party um, as a way of just uh, connecting to this moment that we all found ourselves in this past forum um, and expressing that through this ritual object. Um, and as part of this ritual of giving these uh, boxes out um, to you know, bring my home to them. Uh, and a lot of the, this activity of paper cutting these boxes does go back to this very ancient Jewish tradition in paper cutting. Um, when I work on paper cutting as its own piece, uh, its own art form by itself, I'm trying to think also, how do I use my aesthetic, bring a very different approach to paper cutting to make something that is very unique and very personal. Um, this is a pair of pieces that say Aish and Mayim, fire and water. Uh, and yeah, just playing with, you know, uh, what the what can the materials do for me as I'm layering these things, and how can I use the this medium itself to connect in a certain way to this ancestral Jewish tradition uh, in in a visual artistic way? Um, I also have the privilege of working with a lot of uh, really great nonprofits. So I've been doing some work with PJ Library. If any of you are PJ Library parents or grandparents, uh, you may have this luggage tag from a number of years ago. Um, this is taking as a starting point, uh, the traveler's prayer to be Lot Haderach. And so it says, go in peace, return in peace, has various modes of transportation on top of translations of different parts of the prayer. Um, and also invited kids to write their own intention on the on additional cards you could put into the, the little address card so their luggage can be returned, um, but also protect us from make this trip blank. Um, so kids can really reflect on what they wanted these uh, what they wanted this trip to be and uh, think about this Jewish ritual of this prayer. Um, I have another piece that I can't tell you about just yet, but if you are a PJ Library subscriber, you will be getting it in the next two months. Um, so get excited for that. Uh, I've designed a number of Haggadahs for different organizations. I think I'm up to four at this point. Um, this is one for Hyas, uh, done a couple years ago. Um, and 
the idea here. So HIAS is an organization that does uh, advocacy for refugees uh, in the United States um, and helps refugees abroad. Um, and Passover being the story of Jews finding freedom, uh, trying to use the iconography of the Seder and blend that with the refugee experience to really make this uh, refugee experience palpable uh, and uh, and very immediate, connecting all these different pieces together. So you can see this is the cover. Uh, in every generation, see yourself as though you left Egypt. Um, and uh, illustrations for Karpas and for Maror. Um, and then really working my way around the Jewish calendar. This is a menorah that I did with uh, an engineer uh, last Hanukkah. Uh, so you can see this is Lucite piece says Hanukkah uh, etched into the glass. You can use it with regular candles. Um, you can also use it with plastic candles. Um, but the writing is an ambigram. So in one direction, it says Hanukkah, and you flip it around, and it says light, uh, which we call the miracle menorah. Um, as a way of capturing Hanukkah is, it's the festival of light. And so bring these two languages, these kind of two worlds together, um, allowing this piece to be used both with regular candles. It also comes with this box of plastic candles. It lights up from the base. You could keep this on your, uh, in your window throughout the whole holiday. Um, and yeah, it's very much this uh, same exercise of how do we take this holiday apart? What does it mean? And how do I use that meaning of the holiday and express that through the artwork itself? Um, there's a long tradition of Omer counters. Uh, the Omer being this, uh, the uh, 49 days that we count between Passover and Shavuot. Um, and throughout Jewish history, Jews will come up with different ways of counting the Omer through visual objects. Uh, there's a uh, Italian, uh, and uh, Southern German tradition of doing little tiny Omer books. They're usually like this big travel size, um, very often hand painted, hand illustrated. Uh, there's a Dutch Portuguese tradition of doing these elaborate uh, carved wood boxes that have paper scrolls inside of it that you scroll through the days one by one. Um, and even so, if you go to Amsterdam or if you go to uh, Jewish synagogues in Dutch colonies in the Caribbean or in South America, you'll often find these. Um, H being for counting the Homer, uh, and then you count the, the weeks, the semanas, and the dios for days. Um, and so, trying to think of, okay, well, if this Homer is this very kind of verbal tradition of every day we count, today is the first day, today is the second day, um, and there's not much else to it. So, how do I make this into a creative exercise where every day I'm actively doing something and making something. And so I uh, started a series where every day of the Omer, I made a number. Um, and so I drew the number and then animated it. Some of them are in uh, Arabic numerals. Some of them are in Hebrew. Um, and the ones I'm actually most proud of are the ones that transition from one language to the other language. Um, so you can see you know, one, six, and then the Zion turns into a seven. Um, the Tetvav turns into a 15. Um, I'm especially proud of, you can see this red on the bottom, uh, where 37 is Lamed Zion at the same time. Um, and so this is a really fun exercise of bringing my creativity every day, uh, which was both really exhausting to have to really produce at this rapid rate, um, but also really fun in a way that I got to connect with this ritual in a different way. Um, and putting this together was really the first time I actually counted the Omer in full myself. Um, and then working on a, a slightly less rigorous schedule, um, I uh, used my graphic design poster uh, appreciation and then thought about what's the thing that uh, we also do on a more weekly basis. Um, on Shabbat, we read the Torah. Um, and so every week or a year in real time, designed a poster advertising that week's Torah portion. And this really allowed me to bring all of my different loves and interests together of typography. So each one of these posters integrates the name of the Torah portion in Hebrew into the design. Um, so you can see this is, uh, and then also tell the story through a singular graphic image. So this is, uh, you'll see the second one from the left on top uh, for Parshat Noah. So we have Noah in the story of Noah in the flood. Uh, you have Nun Chet spelling out Noah. 
Um, in the water droplet, the negative space of the water droplet is the arc. Um, on the top here, you see the Mat Arat, where the arc would later end. Um, next to it is Vaishev, which is the beginning of the Joseph story. Um, so it has his striped coat. Uh, the yellow stripes spell out Vaishev in Hebrew. And then you can see his arms uh, holding the prison bars, um, trying to capture the entire story of this coat being a catalyst that brings everything in motion until at the end of Vaishev, he finds himself in an Egyptian prison as a result of this series of events that the coat brought apart. Um, and this was such a powerful experience for me of every week sitting down with a Chumash, reading the Torah portion and thinking about what does this mean? What are the themes? What are the emotions that these uh, individuals, these characters are going through? Um, and then how can I distill all of this subject matter into this singular graphic image that hopefully conveys at least my midrashic interpretation of what these stories represent and what they mean to us today. Um, and in some cases, that's really going against what uh, you know, the traditional explanation of some of these pieces um, or focusing on different characters. So on the bottom uh, for Ahari Moksh, the story of the scapegoat, um, the high priest puts all the sins of the people of Israel onto this goat and sends the goat out to the desert on Yom Kippur. And reading the story, it felt to me that the goat is actually the main character in this narrative. And to try to imagine what is the goat going through and what is the goat's responsibility? How does the goat kind of shoulder the weight and the burden of the Jewish people uh, on his shoulders? Um, and this, is, this poster is my tribute to that goat and how the goat is kind of accepting this mantle of responsibility. Um, and ultimately put all 54 of these images into a book. Um, you'll find this, uh, Beth, um, uh, there's a whole store that you can see all the artists in the series um, are, uh, have pieces that are out there so you can find the book and all the individual posters. I really encourage you to look through it. Um, email me if there are pieces that you'd like to know more about. Um, and yeah, it was uh, very gratifying at the end to put all this work together into a single book um, and uh, have this be the second Torah, right? There's this uh, tradition that everyone is supposed to write a Torah for themselves. Um, and this is the Torah that I got to write um, through, uh, through my art. Uh, and then the last piece that I want to show you, I had the really amazing privilege of being a contestant in a Jewish art reality competition show <laughs> this past February uh, called Expedition Maker, uh, which was run by Moisha House, where uh, 10 Jewish artists made art on a different theme every week for four weeks. Um, ultimately, uh, I uh, was the winner of the show, which I'm, I'm super proud of. Um, and this is the, the final piece I made for the show. This is a Havdalah set um, in the shape of a, a city block. Um, you can see the different objects uh, that we use for the, the Havdalah ritual are all built into this. So you see there's a Kiddush cup, which is the water tower. The Havdalah candle is the street lamp. Um, Shavua Tov, so this piece of graffiti uh, on the side of the building, this is on a magnet. So this comes off of the wall. And these colors are made of spices that I shook onto the paper and uh, glued down. Um, so the graffiti is the spices that you can smell. Um, the mailbox is a tzedakah box. Um, and I think this captures all of the different things that I'm trying to accomplish with my work of how can I make Jewish objects that are new, that are unique, that are relevant, that incorporate all of the artistic influence and, and aesthetic influences that are meaningful to me, um, that I would feel you know, as much at home in the, in the kinds of art galleries uh, that I would want to go to, even if they don't necessarily look like they're traditionally Jewish or in the kind of traditional uh, Judaica mode. Um, but things that are also very functional, that they could be used on a weekly basis. Um, and I encourage all the, all the kids that I speak to, all the adults that I lead workshops for, to think about what are the, uh, what are the artistic media that are meaningful to you, that you enjoy working in? Um, and then what are the messages that you are trying to express through the work that you uh, would like to create 
Um, and to be able to give people the freedom to think, well, just because you think Judaica looks a certain way doesn't mean that it has to. Um, and that if you have a different spin on it, go for it. Like, take this chance, take this opportunity. There's nothing stopping you from making work um, that you can use either in your own home um, or if you feel it's, you know, uh, to be part of your professional, uh, professional work, uh, to be able to produce that stuff for other people as well. Um, and I've really had the amazing joy and privilege to be able to produce work um, that other people have in their houses and get to work on a regular basis. Um, and so if you'd like to follow me around the internet, um, you can see the work that I'm up to on a regular basis by following me on Instagram. Um, if you go to my website, you can sign up to get things like this Omer counter in your email. Um, and also my contact information is on there. Please be in touch about anything that you could possibly think about. Um, and uh, if we have a couple minutes, I would, if there are any questions, I'd, I'd love to uh, talk more about really anything that you'd like to hear about. Um, so, Hillel, first of all, thank, I mean, I'm just blown away. You take our imaginations to places we've never been. Just your creativity is outstanding. Um, so before we open it up to questions, I do want to just mention really quickly that we have an, another amazing artist on here, um, Anna Abramson, who is another participant in our virtual art show, and she's on here. So after we do our questions, we're going to spend about five minutes introducing her incredible work. Um, but with that said, um, so I'm actually going to kick it off. Please think about your questions, but I, I wanted to ask one quick question. Um, I think, you know, your creativity is one thing that really stands out about you. And I think for a lot of people, sometimes it's very hard to get to that space of thinking about what you want to create and tapping into that zone. I'm just curious for you, how do you get to that space? Is there a time of the day that is best for you to tune into your imagination and connecting the dots? Or do you have any advice for people essentially on how to connect to that space of innovation? Sure. Um, I think there's, there's two parts of it. One is to be able to engage with, uh, with the rituals, I think it involves just a little bit of, um, of focus and, and dedication um, that I think the best work comes out of a place where you, uh, I can sit down and think about, you know, what does this mean? What aspects of this ritual or this holiday or this text am I trying to represent? Um, and go for a walk, take a shower, cook dinner, like whatever it is, to just let these ideas kind of percolate and work their way through. Um, and I, to me, I, it's often hard to describe because you know, it just kind of comes, um, but it, it doesn't just come by itself. It comes because I put myself, you know, I, I practice um, being creative. And I think that's uh, and the more you work uh, at doing creative work, um, the more easily it becomes to kind of brainstorm on your own to sketch. I have all of the mail, all the credit card bills, everything, all the envelopes have tons of doodles on them as I'm trying to get a, a you know, quick sketch out while I'm on a client call with for a different project. Um, and then I think the second thing is deadlines that if left around devices, I would never finish anything. <laughs> um, and that it's really having an endpoint to say, okay, this is for this holiday and it needs to be done by this point, I think gives me the, the kick in the pants that I need to uh, kind of jumpstart my thinking and to think faster, work more quickly. Um, and at the very least, just get started because once you start working on something, um, you realize, oh, this piece is really good. I wanna do more of that. Or actually this idea that I had is not, this isn't really gonna work out. Um, I need to do a different tack, but you don't discover that until you're in the middle of it. Um, right. And so, yeah, significant part of it is uh, know that, okay, this needs to be done by next Friday, and I, I just need to sit down and do it and just work and work and work until it's either working and you can press forward, or you've exhausted all the ideas that don't work and are left with the only one that does. Right. Right. Yeah, sometimes deadlines and pressure are really the only thing that can get me started. Yeah. Um, but I might actually stop. Do you mind stop sharing your um, page okay. so that we can see you in a bigger screen? Sorry, awesome. Hi. So why don't we open it up if anybody has any questions? Um, 
feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat box. Um, um, I have a question. You can great. hear me? Yes. I, um, yeah. yeah um, Hillel, I'm fascinated by the ease with which you seem to hop from material to material. Uh, the mural or uh, I'm not sure what material it was adhered onto the brick that had been defaced with the swastika. I mean, how do you find, uh, or do you first think, well, it has to be some kind of a, you know, it has to be a matte finish or it has to be shiny or, I mean, how do you come up with your approaches to all these myriad of materials that you use? Sure. So. I, I'm a very big proponent of a kind of materials first approach to making work um, that uh, I think the best work comes out of, uh, of a place of be, just being thoroughly thought out um, and letting the materials speak to the, uh, to the goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, and so that means that if, uh, you know, if I want something to be small and intimate, or I wanted to have a feeling of, of intimacy, then maybe I want to work smaller. And so then the paper cutting turns into this, uh, not just uh, the medium that is good for packaging because you can kind of open it and, uh, and it's workable, um, but the detail that you can put into the paper also speaks to the, the goal that I'm trying to achieve with these tiny Michelle Cornell boxes, that, that these are special pieces and that uh, you interact with them um, in this very direct way. Um, and the murals are kind of the opposite, that these are huge pieces and uh, to think about, okay, well, this is on cinder block, this is on brick, this is on stucco. Um, and to let the, uh, and also this is facing the sun, this is in the shade the whole day. Um, this is uh, generally blocked by cars that are parked up until here. So the design needs to be up there. And so to, to deeply consider the physical spaces that I'm going to be working with and kind of let that guide the piece that for the, the very first mural that I showed at the bakery, the majority of the text is higher up because down below there's parking. And so I want to make sure that this mural or that the, the bulk of this mural could be viewed um, regardless of how full the parking lot would be. Um, at the, the JCC piece on the brick, um, the base layer is this dark, very bit rich purple. Um, which serves both to thoroughly cover up all of the uh, you know, graffiti that had been put there previously, um, but it also allowed the much brighter colors that I was using to paint on top of it, the yellow, green, red, and light blue, to really pop out and to be super visible from, uh, from the street. Um, and yeah, I think that it's, uh, it's so important, I, and I try to get uh, kids to think about this when I do workshops of think about what are the properties of the material that you're working with? Is it shiny? Is it, uh, you know, is it bendable? Um, does it, will it shake in the wind? And then use that, right? Like uh, if it's a little bit see-through, then if you put a light behind it, then it will glow. Um, you can also, if it's see-through, then you can put silhouettes in there and then they'll show through in a different way. Um, and that'll, add to whatever the effect that you're doing and can also kind of guide the process and lend more inspiration um, to the kinds of messaging and uh, and design work you can build into the project. Wow, thank All right. you. All right, thank you, Ruth. Um, so I just was looking at the time. Um, so if you have any further questions, we're gonna, I wanna introduce Anna and we're gonna speak with her about five to six minutes. Um, but if you have any other questions, Hillel, do you mind putting your email address in the chat and also your website so people, yeah. and again, um, I'm going to, I posted the websites to the art show and I'm going to put them one more time. Um, the second one, second one is his direct page. So please go check it out. It's got a lot of great stuff on there. Um, so now I'm going to uh, introduce Anna. I'm gonna go ahead and put you on here. So great to have you on here. Thank you so much. Um, Anna is one of our artists, as I mentioned, I just, I wanted to give her this chance to show some of her work because it's really incredible. So um, do you mind just sharing where you are and uh, what your medium is? And then I'll show some images. 
Sure. Hi. Uh, first of all, hello. Wow. That was uh, super cool and super inspiring. So I'm really glad I, I got to catch your presentation. Um, so uh, I am based in Los Angeles. I am a visual artist. I work mostly on paper. Um, I come from a background of figurative art with a kind of very classical figurative training. Um, and when I, uh, when, when I was, after I finished art school, I moved to Israel and it was there that I was introduced to the world of Judaica. Uh, and like Hillel, I had this notion of Judaica being very traditional and a very specific aesthetic. Uh, and I also have been, um, have spent, you know, the last uh, 10 years now sort of marrying uh, my figurative training with, with this love I have of Judaic art. Right. So I just wanted to share a couple images. I was figuring, um, share part of the page where we could see your ketubas. And then also I wanna share first my absolute favorite painting of yours. Um, do you mind sharing a little bit about this one? Sure, so this is actually a drawing um, so last year when the pandemic hit, I had my little kids home and um, most of my business is, uh, is ketubas. So um, suddenly there weren't so many to do, uh, but I also had very little time because of the kids not having school anymore. Um, so I found myself really kind of going inward um, and uh, I challenged myself to do kind of a materials first project and put out an entire body of work that was entirely in colored pencil. Um, and so the thing about colored pencil is you kind of have to work very, very slowly and very meticulously uh, and very small. Um, and this was the first one I did. It was actually is very small. It's only eight by eight, but I ended up going up to 30 by 22 of these like highly realistic, highly detailed drawings uh, entirely in colored pencil. And that was, that was how I survived 2020. <laughs> and what's the name of this again? Um, this one's called Grandma's Hands or Babushka's Hands. Babushka's Grandma in Russian. I love it. Yeah, it reminds me of my grandmother. So I, I feel a, and I sh I'm sure for a lot of people, it um, makes me feel connected as I see that. And then I also want to show this image. I love this one as well. Uh, so this one is um, from 2019. It's called The Blessing. Um, A body of work was just art without a specific function. So not ketubot, not blessings for the home, uh, not um, not mezuzah cases. Something that was just art for its own sake, and yet it still had that Judaic twist. Um, and this was uh, probably the most kind of uh, popular piece from it. Let's say. <laughs> right. Right. So why don't I show? your page they can see your beautiful ketubas um just scrolling down um yeah so you can see that um that my figurative background is still very much there in my judaic work um and it's sort of it's a marriage of the the influences of the patterns and uh symbolism from traditional judaica but a contemporary take on it because it's married <laughs> to the figurative art right right and then i know you also have i mean you have all sorts of judaica um you have some chuppas remember yeah some. i um I, I i make all sorts of stuff um until recently it was very wedding centered but um 2021 is the year that i decided to venture into um wearable art so i'm actually working on a line of talitos which was my first time really working with like uh you know draping and like how uh, a garment how art can be translated into a wearable form and how it drapes and how it um how it, it it's a three-dimensional project as opposed to working 2d so it's very interesting for me um and i'm, I'm really excited to launch those um in a few weeks are there any other items you wanted to you'd suggest we open up? We have time for one more. I'd just like to share. Um, uh, we could show like the maybe the hollow boards or um, or mezuzah cases. Hi, there are. 
Yeah, so beautiful. Yeah, so these are hala boards I make, and you can see a lot of the same um, theme of, of being partly figurative um, and then also inspired by nature and, and Judaica. Right. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for coming in and sharing a bit of your work. I'm also going to share her page into Hillel. This, I mean, the two of you are just so incredibly creative, and it's been an honor to have you on here. And uh, Anna, can you also put your um, uh, contact information in case anybody want to uh, follow up with you? And uh, so, yeah, again, sure. Hillel, thank you so much. Um, and I'll send the recording to you so you can share it with others who maybe weren't able to join today. But uh, with that said, so tomorrow we have David Moss at 10 a.m. And then we have two Portland-based artists, Diane Fredgant and Lori Fendel from, um, as I mentioned, Portland, and they'll be showing you their work. But uh, hopefully we can catch you guys tomorrow. And again, thank you so much. And I hope everybody has a great rest of their night. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Anna. Good night, everybody. <laughs>